time to go ahead. Sorry. Um, sorry. Very sorry. When did you start painting? Could we take that again? Yes, sorry. We give it I, I'm, I'm going to give you the question again. Sorry. When did you start painting? Well, very suddenly. I was in, um, after I left school, I was in uh, the, to some extent, in Trinity College as a kind of external, in an external capacity, and uh, learning chemistry in connection with an oil refinery in which my, which my small oil refinery, which my parents, my grandfather, had founded. And um, I was there for a couple of years, and then rather suddenly, and with um, uh, a certain uh, desperation, because it was not approved of, I uh, had to leave suddenly in order to become a painter. I had to clear right out of the country. Well, did family support end at that point? Were you on your own? Uh, you my own? immediate family, my father and mother, were extremely understanding about it and um, helped me in the first very difficult time when I was first of all started to paint in France. But I had no time to go to any kind of school or uh, no art school of any kind, no formation of that kind. And so I had to do my studying really in galleries. So I had to go to the National Gallery and then to the Louvre and then to the Prado, which was then in Geneva, and that's where I did my study. Do you think that's a good way to, st to study art, or do you see your lack of an art school training as something of an inhibition in the beginning of your career? I think, like most people who have never been to universities, there is always a kind of nagging regret that one has not had that formation. But on the other hand, the formation which is available at that time was of a very poor nature, I think, very inferior. And I think perhaps I did as well, simply trying to learn directly from paintings from the past. Well, what artists around those galleries and painting in Europe at that time, because Europe was certainly very much a center of art then, were really influencing you? Uh, I really started a very long way back. I mean, I really fell in love with Rembrandt and Manet and Goya and so on. And um, really, that's how I, it was from those roots that I started any sensibility I have comes from that. 1939 uh, seems to be marked down as the year in which your painting career really started. Was there any one event that really marked that? Uh, the event of going away on a boat and starting. In, uh, I started to paint in the south of France because, ironically enough, it was the cheapest place you could live at that time in Europe. Degas and Manet have been noted by various critics as influential at this, at this early point in your career, and Cubism was another interest which you started at that time. Yes, Manet is uh, almost, almost uh, singly my primary influence at that time, and Degas because of his association in that whole group. As for Cubism, that came a little later influenced me rather a little later, and I became enslaved by it in a sense, as we all became enslaved by Picasso, this Promethean figure, and uh, for many years he overshadows us, overshadows, overshadows us all, and eventually, uh, of course, came the eventual rebellion, sometime at the very beginning of the 60s, really, it was as late as that, and uh, I suppose, like the rest, I that I had a, a sea change, as so many others did about that period. Right. You just hold it there for a second, Bob. Are we having problems with? Yes. Um, Without the major part of your career, Picasso has been dominating European painting, and in this period when you were in Europe working, Picasso was beginning or at the edge of the height of his career. How great an influence had he on you? Well, I think that uh, some of his influence was direct and some of it was indirect. You must remember that nearly everybody was more or less influenced by him. Even to some extent Francis Bacon, who rebelled against him, even in his painting, but even he admits to, in fact claims, 
a very considerable influence in the early days. And, um, and people like, for instance, Jankel Adler, a Polish artist who had a tremendous effect on British painting in the, all through the 50s, late 40s and early 50s, uh, he was again derivative of Picasso to a very large extent, and so he passed this in this uh, seminary influence on to the rest of us. So there were very few of us who really escaped all of Picasso's enormous yes. influence. The, the subjects of m many of your early paintings were subjects of s sort of social isolation, you might almost call them. Um, tinkers, prisoners, people like this who had been to some extent rejected and isolated by society. Was there a, or is there in, in your own mind, a feeling of isolation in yourself? Do you f identify with them? Well, it's quite true. This is, this is a purely personal thing. It has nothing to do with um, Picasso or any other influence. This seems to be some kind of tendency or proclivity of my own. Uh, because it's my own, I find it particularly difficult to analyze. It's something which happens within me, some preoccupation of mine, which I can't analyze. But it certainly, I can see that I have always had some kind of preoccupation with the human condition, the, which I've always tended to see as being, if not an isolated condition, at least in that the human being, the fundamental reality of the human being, is in the individual and not in the group or the, or the uh, crowd, but is in each individual which composes that group or that crowd and which can be translated into other groups I and other crowds. I think to many people that would be apparent. Uh, all the subjects of your many paintings were invariably human ones. However, when we look at your tapestries, subjects are quite different. S thinking of your tapestries of the late 40s and early 50s, for instance, the subjects were, and style was very much Picasso and Lurka-ish. Very much. I learned, in a sense, tapestry from Lursa, whom I knew. I learned the manner in which one could make modern tapestries from him, and uh, from but from the nature of tapestry itself, which I was always inclined to regard as a kind of recreation from painting in a way, insofar as the process was so different, one could get, uh, one could relax insofar as one could uh, exhaust oneself in a different way, you know, a completely different way. And tapestry in its nature seemed to lend itself, to my mind, to more archetypal imagery, less, in, less peering into the individual state, rather, rather the production of archetypal images, like the, those Adam and Eve series, the Eden series, or indeed any of the tapestries, are very much more abstracted in this sense. Certainly the abstraction of the tapestry comes across, but as you say, you, you regard this as a recreation away from painting, and yet many critics are arguably uh, say that uh, this has realized some of your best work. Would you agree? Uh, I wouldn't... Uh, I, I would place them on two different planes. Uh, the sense of recreation is a personal one, insofar as the process is so different that it would be rather like I don't know uh, somebody who was uh, a, a, an all-rounder sportsman and who regarded uh, cricket as being a, an out recreation from tennis or vice versa. Neither is better than the other, but the two completely different activities. The Toyn tapestries, for those who, of us who haven't seen your tapestry work for some time, illustrate a major departure into a very, shall we say, analytical approach to art, similar to the hard edge things and the and paintings of Vasarelli and his sort of chromatic pro progressions of color. Is it as simple as that? Is it simply a, a sort of isolated subject to you? The, uh, 
the torn tapestries were a great break, but they were a break from over a very long time because the earlier series of tapestries which I did were done 25 and 20 years ago. And uh, so these are necessarily very different, but they do remain also archetypal and based on, on myth and, and, uh, and um, a, a mass, uh, a kind of race memory, a kind of uh, 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 the interesting thing about the Toyn, which I had the great privilege of being able to illustrate, is that to my mind it is not so much that it is an historic truth which indeed it has very much a great deal of, if not historic, proto-historic truth, but We haven't seen any tapestries from you for some time, and certainly to those people who are familiar with your tapestry work, the Toyn tapestries will certainly illustrate a big departure in subject matter and treatment. They are a departure. They're, um, they're but I have not done tapestry really for, really, since that last series, uh, which took place 25 to 20 years ago. And so they're necessarily very different. One thing they have in common, perhaps, is that they are, as it were, archetypal, or in their nature, or they have a kind of um, race imagery rather than a particularized uh, examination of the human individual and uh, this is based on in this instance of the toy itself which as you know is a an 8th century an 8th century manuscript which has come down to us in uh, one shape or form through storytelling and so on and so on and which represents in a sense not merely the uh, historic uh, facts uh, or proto-historic facts which occurred in the first and second century, but, but more the historic mind. And uh, this, it is this historic mind which has come down to us in this form and which must still have some relevance for us, mm. I feel. And this is what fascinated me in this respect. In your mind, there's obviously then a continuation of an intellectual subject matter lying behind these images, and as well as that, very much in this case especially, a literary bias, or a literary base, I should say. But to many people looking at them, I think they will equate them with the work of Vasali, whose ideas are very simple, straight visual imagery uh, relating to the sort of chromatic progression of colour. But you obviously intend something much deeper than that to come out of these, these tapestries, or to be seen in these tapestries. They have grown in this way. I quite understand, and I see myself, indeed, the relevance to Vasarelli and uh, other, particularly Vasarelli. Uh, they happen to have come about in that way. They have come about to some extent, and there is this connection with my painting, that in the painting I have for some years now, as it were, destroyed the actual surface itself and made of it a kind of atmosphere or soup which, from which might emerge a plausible image. The, in the case of these tapestries, I have employed that method to the extent that I have allowed this mass of head images, these points or heads, to, as it were, emerge from a background. And the sense of emergence is something which happens to have preoccupied in a completely different and very visual manner, Vasarelli. And so hence the resemblance, which I think is a superficial one. Running then currently, or concurrently, I should say, with your work in tapestry has been your painting. And uh, since 1956, this has seemed to be the preoc main preoccupation is with um, a monochromatic canvas, your white period, some people have called it. What brought that about? 
As for the whiteness, I can't say. This is another temperamental thing which I can't answer for. Perhaps it was simply a kind of neutrality, a kind of all color or no color from which the image could, as I say, plausibly emerge. The beginning of those of that period, which occurred about 1957 or so, uh, was um, was uh, quite a difficult and painful decision insofar as previously, as a rather, I think, to me, traditionally based painter, I had to uh, disrupt and chuck out all I had felt and learnt about composition, starting with, shall I say, the first four lines of any painting, which are the first four lines of the sides of the rectangle of the painting. Uh, I had to throw that all out and produce this uh, new sense of the emergence of a plausible emergence of a single image from a background which in itself appeared to be an atmosphere, a space without definition. At the same time as you can talking, talk in these very cold terms about your art and your work as a painter, lying behind it all the time, are these subjects, subjects of ex about, as you said before, the human condition. One of the most uh, important paintings around that time, or one of the most interesting around 1956, marking your turn, was this painting of Caroline, the Mongoloid child. And it seems to express so much of your intention of, a, of saying something about human beings and their problem and their personalities. Does this interest still continue on? Yes, I think that that little painting to which you refer, which is uh, even... In all of these white period paintings, where you've been painting the human being, rarely have you shown any real interest in the visual appearance. You seem to be always searching for something within the individual, a sort of a painting of a personality. Do you think it's possible to paint, to make a visual image of that which is unseen? Uh, I've asked myself that question very many times. It's uh, a difficult one and at times for me rather an agonizing one. I am still indeed uncertain in the end as to whether or not what I am trying to do is really valid or appropriate even. That is, the, the attempt to, to realize by plastic means something which is uh, essentially not plastic and which is to do, has to do with the interior reality of the human presence you once described painting as a kind of personal archaeology, suggesting a, a, an inner search, a search within yourself. Have you discovered anything in that search? I make small discoveries, mostly chips and broken pieces, nothing very uh, complete. Uh, however, by sometimes I feel that by going on with this particular form of digging that now and again I'm able to piece together with these pieces something more whole and more significant. Throughout your career and throughout the things you've said about your work you've always stressed this point about the individual and the importance of the individual and you said that you felt that people today seem to align themselves in groups and in factions and seem to suffer in groups and in factions. Do you think that has any particular significance for our contemporary Northern Ireland situation? Well, I think everyone in uh, almost the world, and certainly anybody who is Irish, is deeply preoccupied by all of that and uh, since what one is preoccupied by 
naturally has got relevance to one's work, it must have some uh, connection. Do you think there is an answer then in what you say, that the individual should be much more important than the faction? Do you think the answer lies within each individual asserting himself? Well, in my painting, I have never tried to uh, exemplify, much less to preach, and um, I could not uh, and would not wish to draw any conclusions from from these things. All I try to do in my work is to try to find, to try to discover things. If those discoveries have any relevance to reality, if one can draw any conclusions from them, I would be glad to think that they had that relevance. But I would not dream of trying to um, produce any work which exemplified a point of view. What do you see as the next development in your work? Is there another big step just ahead for you? No, I can't foresee that. I don't think any artist can foresee that. Uh, we were talking recently about uh, archaeology or this feeling that which I have, which the work is in some way analog analogous to archaeology, and I could no more say what was going to be the direction of my work in future than I suppose an archaeologist could say what he was going to find in his dig. Merely you feel the search will continue. I feel the search will continue. Right, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. I didn't say thank you on that because it's better if we hear your last word. We haven't in fact seen tapestry work of yours for some time and for many people the, the Toyn tapestries will represent a considerable departure from the ideas they were associated in your tapestries before. The Toyn tapestries seem to have a quality of analysis about them. They're analytical and cold and somehow very similar to the hard-edged work that we associate with Vasarelli and seem to be a, quite a, a departure away from your normal human subject. You once said that people seem to align themselves in groups and in factions and they also suffer in those groups and factions. Do you, do you think this has any particular significance for contemporary Northern Ireland? Well, what do you see as the next development in, in your work? Is there a big step ahead? Right, right. Did we get the cutaways for poultry? 